Hello there, and welcome to this week's Granny's Garden. Now, this week, it's all about nighttime terrors. Slugs, snails, and earwigs. All of them nocturnal, and all of them can wreak havoc on your garden. Stripping seedlings back to bare stems, and leaving leaves like lace curtains. Utter devastation and utter despair. I'd like you to meet Barney. Barney's one of my woodland friends that I have scattered around the garden. And Barney is the only snail I like, and it's the only snail I want in my garden. Good boy, Barney. Snails and slugs are gastropods from the Greek word gastro, meaning stomach, and pod, meaning foot. So it's basically a stomach foot, or a foot that walks along on its belly. So what is the difference between slugs and snails? Both are nocturnal. Both are gastropods. Both of them need to hide away to escape the heat of the day and also to escape their predators, mainly birds. However, there is one glaringly obvious difference. One has a big, huge house on its back and the other one doesn't. And for this very reason, their actual habitats are different. Slugs are nice and slim and can squeeze into little cracks and squeeze upon the mulch laid down on the ground. The snail with this big rucksack on its back, well, it can't do it. It simply doesn't fit. So snails are going to look for a different type of habitat. They're going to look for places they can fit, but at the same time give them refuge from the sun and from their predators. Things that are slightly elevated from the ground, for instance, planks of wood that you've left lying around, or debris from a building. They also like hedges or ivy along the ground, perfect places for them to hide during the day. Snails and slugs are a real pain for any garden as they are terribly destructive but they are extremely successful in breeding. Both of them are hermaphrodites, which means they've got male and female organs. They can mate. Both of them can produce sperm, and both of them can lay eggs. And oh boy, do they lay eggs. A slug can lay up to 500 eggs per year, and a snail can lay 80 eggs at a time, six times a year. That's a whopping amount of snails and slugs. So knowing their habitat and knowing their habits, you have half the battle won. So how do you go about the problem of resolving your issue with slugs and snails? Well, there might not be one single solution, but you can certainly attack it from many different angles, some of them more orthodox than others. However, I'd like to discuss each one of them in a little bit more detail. Make your gardening less inviting for them. We already know that slugs and snails, and indeed earwigs, like wet, moist environments. Therefore, do the best you can to reduce the moisture. If you live in a hot country like I do and you do need an irrigation system, if at all possible, use a drip system with targeted emitters at the foot of each root ball. That way you're only watering the plant and you're not watering the surrounding area, which makes a beautiful skating rink for them to slither on. If, like me, you have a lawn and you have to use a sprinkler system, well then program it to turn on in the morning. And that way you've got the whole day for it to dry out and when the beasties come out to play... Boy! <laughs> And that way, when the beasties come out to play at night, the environment is hostile for them. Clean up the mess in your garden. Hack down those weeds that invite the snail to hide there during the day. Lift up that old bucket and put it back in the shed. That old plank that's been lying there for the last six months. Great hiding places for slugs and snails during the daytime. Also, if you do have a flower pot, one of these big large flower pots, lift it up slightly on legs. That way the air is going to circulate underneath it and it's going to dry it out. And it makes it less inviting for those little wee pesties to sleep during the day there. It's important to note the different habits between young earwigs and older earwigs. Now, younger earwigs go after new little seedlings and very immature leaves, whilst the older earwigs go after the petals of your dahlias. What can you do to avoid at least part of the problem? What I do is I try and not sow seeds directly into the ground because those little seedlings or immature little plants are an absolute magnet for earwigs. What I do is I try and sow my seeds indoors and then I pot them up until the plant grows a bit and it's less attractive to those young earwigs. And when it's at a certain size, then it's when I plant it in the ground. And that solves the issue of the younger earwigs. We still have to resolve the problem of the older earwigs, but we'll come back to that later. It is important to note that earwigs are beneficial to the garden and to the gardener. They eat aphids and they eat insect eggs. Their problem comes when you get a superpopulation and that's what you want to avoid. So you can set a trap for them. At night, roll up an old newspaper, a nice, moist, wet newspaper. And when they finish feasting on your dahlias, then they'll crawl into it to sleep during the day. You come down in the morning, lift it up and shake it out into a bucket or whatever, and then get rid of them. 
If you do that over the course of several days, you're going to reduce the population without eliminating them completely. Make life more difficult for those little wee beasties. If you have a shrub that's getting attacked and the branches are touching the ground, along comes your wee beasties, climbs up the ramp and then can get at those nice tender growths and tender leaves. If you prune up the branches, just four inches, five inches at the very most, it makes life much more difficult for them and much easier for you. Some people swear that turning your garden into a beer garden is the best solution and inviting everybody in for a wee drinky. I haven't ever tried this method. Some people say it works. I can't say one way or the other. But the general idea is that you get your can of beer, cut out the top, leave one third of the can, sink it into the ground so that the lip is at ground level. And the idea is they get attracted by the smell, they crawl into it and then they drown because they can't get out again. That's the general idea. I don't know if it works or not. As I said, I haven't ever used it, but some people do swear by it. Eggshells. Now it is absolutely true that snails or slugs do not like crawling over rough, dry areas. However, I do actually have experience with eggshells and I can absolutely tell you it doesn't work. I had a thick layer, I had a really wide band and the snails and slugs just thumbed the nose at me, crawled over it and ate my plants anyway. So for me, it's a no-no. The next thing I want to look at is salt. Now salt actually does work. So how does it work? Well, salt dehydrates things and as the snails and slugs crawl over it, it dehydrates their body and can actually kill them through dehydration or desiccation. I definitely would not recommend this. The soil remains on the surface and the more you use it, the more it percolates into the ground and changes the composition of the soil, changing the natural balance of minerals in your soil. So definitely for me, I would never recommend it. The next thing is ground limestone. Now this does work. It is extremely sharp and slugs and snails definitely do not like crawling over it. It is very, very uncomfortable for them. However, a bit like the salt, you're going to prepare it in a wide band around the base of your plants and this is going to be percolating into your soil and the more it rains, the more you need to apply it and the more it percolates in and it's actually going to change the composition of your soil. It's going to raise the pH and make your soil more and more alkaline. Can you imagine if what you're trying to protect is a hydrangea? Well, the worst thing you can have is protect an acid loving plant with an alkaline protector. Doesn't work. Something that really, really does work and it's totally innocuous for everybody, is hand picking. What you need to do is in the evening, water well, so the terrain is completely soaked and wet and just the perfect environment for those slithery, slimy snails and slugs. Then maybe about midnight or one o'clock in the morning, you get a good hand torch and you go out. You'll see that the snails and slugs have come out from underneath the hedges and coming out of their hidey holes and they'll be crawling along the grass and crawling along the paths and go with a little bucket Pick them up by hand and just keep plopping them in the bucket. You might get about 20 or 40 or 50 or 100. And if you do that for a few nights, again, you're going to reduce the population. It may be a bit of a pain, but it certainly works. Another thing that really, really works is to increase the predators. Increase that bird population in your garden. Plant some nice trees. Put a bird bath in. Put some bird feeders in and welcome those song thrushes, those blackbirds, those magpies that are going to devour with gusto your snails and your slugs. And on top of it, they look pretty and they sound lovely. The next thing I want to show you is the use of copper. Now the mucus that the slugs and the snails use to slide along, when it comes in contact with copper, creates a chemical reaction and it actually gives them an electric shock and they definitely don't like that. What is important is that the copper you use not be little copper tubing, but wide foil patches, at least five centimeters wide. That way they can't get from one side of the barrier to the other without putting their entire foot on the foil or on the strip. Now, this year I want to introduce into my garden some hydrangeas. In order to prepare the terrain, I carried out an experiment and I'm delighted to be able to share the results because it deals with exactly what we're looking at, the use of copper to deter slugs and snails. Now we know that they like young, tender plants. So what I did is I went out and deliberately bought two tender hydrangea plants in little four inch pots. And I planted them with a, with a certain separation. And on one of the hydrangeas, I placed a copper band around and on the other hydrangea, I had no protection whatsoever. And I just want to turn the camera around and show you what the results are. Now, this is the first of the hydrangea plants that I wanted to show you. And it's looking really quite healthy. Now, if I lift it up, 
you can see that under here I've got that copper band. It's beginning to get a bit of a green patina, but that's quite normal in copper. What I've done is I've deliberately left a few branches or a few leaves touching the ground here just to demonstrate what happens if you don't prune up. As soon as you leave something touching the ground, these little beasties are really clever and they find that it is possible for them to climb onto the plant without meeting the copper barrier. So immediately you're going to find damage. So it's very important just to come in now and again and just snip off any leaf that might be touching the ground so that you continue to have this barrier that they can't get across. So for me, copper has definitely, definitely worked. Now we're going to see the other plant without the copper barrier. This is so, so sad. This is all that's left of the hydrangea plant. A few little sticks in the ground. The first thing they did is came in and decimated the leaves. Then they started decimating the actual stems themselves. And within nothing, maybe a couple of weeks, the plant went from a healthy four inch can of a hydrangea into a few sticks, a few green sticks that then died. And now, as you can see, they're all completely dead. That was a leftover of a flower. It, was even, it had even started to flower and then it was just completely and utterly decimated. So no barrier obviously didn't work. So for me, I'm definitely sticking with the copper band. So you'll see the importance of experimenting. I always experiment and I learn so much from it. So now I want to do stage two of an experiment. Recently, two red caladiums sprung up in my garden less than a week ago. I know it's very, very late, but I planted them really, really late. And in actual fact, I thought that they hadn't taken. 24 hours after they surfaced, the first slugs had bitten holes in them. Oh. So what I want to do is, I've got two plants. On one of them, place a copper ring. And on the other one, I want to place some slug bait. And then I want to compare results in a few weeks' time. And obviously, I'll take you along on that journey because this is very interesting because slugs and snails are the bane of every gardener's life. Now, copper foil comes either flat-packed or like this, in little round packages. Just remove the top and you'll see that the little strips are coiled round inside. Now, let's just take it out. And as soon as I take it out, it's going to just flop open. There we go. So it's going to flop open. Now each of these copper strips is exactly five centimeters wide. Can you see that? Five centimeters. And they are 55 centimeters in length. Now if I curve it round, that gives a nice diameter for most plants. If it's too small, all you need to do is join two of them together. And I'll show you in a minute how you do that. And that'll be able to surround even quite a substantial plant. Now, what you need to do in order to join them together is cut halfway through on the top on one side and halfway through on the base on another side. Twist it round and slot it together. Right, this is where I'm going to be installing the copper band. And I just started cleaning out some of the debris. And as I was withdrawing, first thing I saw was a snail. Can you see that? I've only just started and there they are. So I'm going to do now is just clean an area around. What I want to do, just put the copper band over the plant like that. And just make sure that it's not, for instance, I don't know if you can see that in the camera, that it's not slightly lifted because these are clever little beasties and although they won't crawl across it, they can certainly go underneath it if they find an opportunity. Now what I want to do is remove the leaf that's got the holes in it so you won't get confused in the experiment. There we go. We're now at the second plant and this is where I'm going to be using snail and slug bait. Now, the first thing is important that it is safe for dogs, your cats and your hedgehogs, because I do have hedgehogs in this garden. It's not only the daytime predators like birds you've got to encourage, but also the nighttime and nocturnal ones, which also feast on slugs and snails. So it's important that this does not hurt them in any way. Now, this is Phosphatoferico, which is iron phosphate. This comes in pellet forms and I do not want to create a barrier. I want to sprinkle a few pellets around to attract those slugs, get them to eat it, and then get them to crawl off wherever they go to die and not bother me anymore. 
I'm seeing here slime trails, which I don't like the look of at all. So let's get cracking on this. The first thing I'm going to do now is remove this leaf, which looks like a bit like a lace curtain at the moment with all these holes in it. So I'm just going to chop that down and leave these other leaves. Well, this has got no damage at all, so I'm going to leave these grow and then see what the effect is. Sprinkle now some of the pellets. And that's it. As you can see, there's not a hell of a lot, but I will be keeping a close eye on because when they start eating these pellets, in actual fact, you can see where they've munged. So I know that they're actually taking the bait. So I'm going to be giving you updates because I think this is very, very important. And uh, certainly slug control and snail control is very important because beautiful, beautiful broad-leaved plants like caladiums or like hostas can become very quickly like lace curtains or indeed, as you've seen in the hydrangeas, they can decimate the plants so much that it just dies. Now, the last thing we're going to be talking about is earwigs, particularly adult earwigs. My problem in this garden is adult earwigs that are very, very attracted, particularly to my flowers and particularly anything daisy-like. I have had any type of flower that looks like a daisy, stripped of every single petal and just leaving the centre eye of the flower. Very, very annoying. So there's really only one way to deal with that, and that is diametaceous earth. There is something very, very important about this. This really does work. It works against every single creepy crawly, which means that it's not only going to kill your earwigs, it's going to kill spiders, it's going to kill ladybirds, it's going to kill every single thing that crawls across it. As they crawl across it, it creates tiny, tiny little fissures or holes in their exoskeleton. The diametaceous earth enters and it desiccates them and they die. Now this, this plant we're seeing here only has buds and it's going to be a few days before they actually open into a flower. So it's not necessary at this present moment in time to be putting anything around the base of the plant. So let's go somewhere else now where there is a flower that needs to be protected and we'll put diametaceous earth around that plant. It's not necessary to be spreading things unnecessarily, especially when they could damage other types of insects. So we're just going to apply this now and just shake it around, making a little circle around the plant. And we'll see how that works. Well, that's the end of this week's video. And certainly I'm looking forward to seeing the results of the new experiment, which is copper versus slug bait. But for the moment, from me, Una, and from my channel, Granny's Garden, and of course, from my best friend Barney, the only snail I want in my garden. It's bye from me and see you next Friday. Bye bye now.